Happy Wednesday, everybody. Today is another big one. We've had another big announcement that's gone all over Twitter, all over the internet right now, and it's about XRP being removed from the green list of the DFS. Now, the DFS is the Department of Financial Services. Essentially, what they've done is, even though they look after the control and the regulation and the kind of guidance on digital assets and virtual currencies and a whole suite of other kind of financial things within the state of New York only, for some reason, they've looked at XRP and said, we need to remove it from the green list. In today's video, we're gonna essentially go over what the DFS is, how much of an impact does the DFS have in New York? How do they compare to the SEC? How do they look when you look at global regulation? How do they play into all of this as well? We're gonna look at the green list itself and the decisions and the criteria required of a coin to actually get into that green list. We're also gonna go into some logical reasons why XRP was removed from this list. Then we're gonna get into the real reasons and we're gonna finish it all off, seeing if there's a link or a connection between the head of DFS and Gary Gensler. As always, of course, my opinions will be thrown in there as well, but I'm gonna kind of reserve that for the real reasons why I think XRP was removed from this list. Let's get into it. So just the other day, the Department of Financial Services in New York, specifically in New York, delisted or removed XRP, the digital asset, from their green list. I think it's important to understand what DFS actually do because it gives you context and actually might bring up some other questions that you didn't realize you had about this whole topic. So first of all, they oversee and regulate financial products and services. That's really interesting because this is slightly different because what you'll be thinking right now is, is that like the SEC? The, the SEC are literally in New York. But if you think about it, when you actually break the, the terms down, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, so everything that's related to potential securities and securities and the exchange of value within there is under the SEC's remit. And then you've got the DFS who are basically looking out for malintent, scamming, uh, AML, you know, anti-money laundering, all of that stuff for financial products and services. And they also work within the insurance area as well as other financial institutions. So they, they work in different areas, it's just exactly in the same state, which is very interesting. So what we actually find as well is that the DFS regulate a massive amount of money, absolutely massive, to the sum of $7.3 trillion. They regulate that among insurance and all of their financial products and services and the institutions that they work with. And their main priorities are, and I'm about to list them here, licensing, examining, supervising financial institutions, investigating complaints, and taking enforcement action. Meaning they kind of work, there's a word in the UK, I think you call this type of company called an ombudsman, but basically taking complaints. And actually what's interesting about this is taking enforcement action. So we're gonna get into that a little bit later about what actually is law and is law even important in all of this? But I wanna progress the video along a little bit here. So when we talk about DFS, they are New York only. Now that is really just New York, it's not any of the other states. But what I want to kind of add a different angle to this on is, New York is a significant entity in all of the cities around the world. Typically, lots of countries around the world, lots of cities, financial hubs around the world, look to each other to see how they've acted and how they're determining what digital assets are and, and virtual currencies are, for example. So just because this is in New York only, it doesn't mean the rest of the states aren't looking. It doesn't mean London's not looking at what New York's doing. You know, it has a, actually, actually has a big impact, just like the SEC has a massive impact on the way things go, right? Even globally, even though it's just in America. So because DFS is significant in New York, it is therefore significant in the rest of the world. So we've got context there. We also understand that the SEC and DFS are different. They work in the same area in finance, essentially, but they work in two separate entities. We're gonna get into at the end of the video whether the SEC and DFS actually get along together. That's gonna to be super interesting. We're gonna look at that at the end of the video. Now, it brings us into what even is law anymore, right? You've seen this with the SEC how the SEC have interacted with XRP 
as if it is illegal, right? They've, they've kind of scorched down their power. They have, but they don't have it through legislative power. They have it just through like guidance power and that in that specific niche they need to be listened to. It's kind of this weird balance of like what is legislative law and what is like enforced law. Those are actually kind of different. And, and DFS work in that capacity where they're actually able to enforce as if it is law, even though it's not legislative law. I find that as a, a dangerous thing. Yeah, I think we have the same thing in the UK and all around the world, basically, you have these entities that are non-elected individuals who, who get into these positions of massive power where they're not elected to be there. They're kind of just put in that position. And also while they're in that position, while they don't have the power of law behind them, they have all of the intent and almost like the effectiveness of law behind them. It's such a weird dynamic. And I think this is when we move into this new financial system and the whole way the new world is going to work. It really does raise questions as to whether if you're more on the white pill side, you're more optimistic about the future, whether these institutions will actually even continue anymore. I mean, there may be, may be no position for them outside of being an elected individual at the head of these companies. I mean, it would be great. Imagine this. How great would it be to be able to elect the head of the SEC and DFS? It'd be wonderful because you're getting regulation that actually reflects the individuals that they say they're trying to protect. So very, very interesting. But I want to get in to this green list. What even is the green list from the DFS? What does that even mean? So if an asset is green listed, basically all it means is that venture capital entities that want to increase their positions or, or start positions in these digital assets, they don't actually have to get prior approval. So if the asset that you're trying to buy isn't on the green list, you actually have to go through the approval of DFS in order to do so. So XRP actually was on the green list previously, like two days ago, and it's just been removed. So previously when entities in New York wanted to buy XRP or start positions in XRP, they didn't need prior approval to do so. However, buying XRP in New York was basically impossible, right? You literally can't do it. And the amount of complaints I get from people saying, I can't use Uphold, I can't use Caleb and Brown to buy XRP, where can I buy XRP? New York is just the absolute worst for buying XRP. So it's interesting how it was on the green list in New York, but no one could buy it anyway. <laughs> now what's happened is that they have removed it. And in order to get back onto the green list, there are a couple of things that need to happen. So here they are. You need a proven track record of safety and soundness. What does that even mean? A proven track record. And also just kind of thinking about that even further. What has XRP or Ripple done to go against safety and soundness? Like what have they done that has put people at risk? Nothing. XRP itself isn't a security, so the, the sales of XRP on the secondary market weren't putting people in danger, right? There's literally no reason why they shouldn't be back on the green list. We're obviously going to pick into that list later on about the reasons why, the, you know, the real reasons why. But the other reason you can get into the green list, again, is that if you are a stablecoin approved by DFS, so what you find is when you look at this green list is basically Bitcoin, Ethereum. That's a whole other story. I mean, how is Bitcoin and Ethereum made it on this list and XRP hasn't? Absolutely mind boggling. But the vast majority of the other assets that are on this green list are all stable coins pegged to the US dollar. So they kind of get that easy way through to be recognized by DFS and then put on that green list. So let's get into why logically DFS will have removed XRP. And by the way, if you're here and you're brand new, I'm trying to up my game here. I'm trying to deliver the best information absolutely possible. Every video I'm trying to make better. So if you got value from this, please do share it with a friend because they will too get value. You can also hit subscribe and click the like button because the algorithm will give this video to more people. And if it's valuable to you, who knows how many more people it might be valuable to. So thank you in advance for subscribing. Let's get into this list. A whole suite of reasons why XRP might be might have been removed from this green list. The first one is that there may have been other regulatory concerns. So I don't know what this possibly could be, but you could think along the lines of the institutional sales of XRP that, you know, is, is still kind of 
in limbo and I think the general consensus among all of the anti-Ripple people is that Ripple has still done something wrong even though XRP is completely cleared and it's not a security by a matter of law. There may be some other concerns there that go against their safety and soundness policy. So potentially that is one reason. Another one is because of market behavior. This is kind of interesting to think about because you're only going to remove something from the list because it has behaved erratically. What's very interesting to me is that Bitcoin and Ethereum also behave erratically. So I can't get behind this one. The only justification I can make for the market behaviors or the volatility as being the reason why XRP would be removed from the green list is on court case resolution day where the price went from like 47 cents to 94 cents in, in seconds it felt like, and it really was just minutes. Maybe that breached something. But when I look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, Bitcoin and Ethereum have done moves like that before. Yet they're still on the green list. So that one, I'm going to mark that straight off. I don't think the other regulatory concerns and the safety and soundness thing actually have any validity either. But I'm just trying to brainstorm all of these ideas. The other one could be potentially that they have technical issues that on the XRPL that warrant the removal. Again, when has the XRPL failed at anything? That's the big question, right? And all of the amendments that are coming to the XRP ledger are only going to improve the system. I don't see how technical issues, I'm going to remove that from the list. I don't see how technical issues can be a factor in removing them from the green list. The other one are external pressures, like we've got other regulatory bodies. I wonder who <laughs> that could be. I'm thinking the SEC, for example, coming in and giving them feedback about Ripple and about XRP and kind of saying you shouldn't be having them on their green list. We, we've been in this court case, you know, I can totally imagine a world where Gary Gensler or Jay Clayton, depending on the timeline, comes into the offices of DFS and says, we want to give our negative feedback. We are an authority in this space about Ripple and XRP and we need you to take them out of that green list. And who knows, an extra salty Gary Gensler who's on soup duty in prison, I heard. <laughs> Follow me on X if you want to see stuff like that. <laughs> Comes in and says, I'm extra salty about this court case resolution. It didn't go in our way. I'm losing everything left, right and center for the SEC. You must stop them from being on that green, that green list. I can imagine a scenario like that. So we're going to keep external pressures out as one of the potential real reasons. We're going to move on to the next one, which would be public perception, right? If the public perception about XRP was extremely negative, DFS would look at that and say, this isn't good, we're going to remove them from that list, right? Do you see the public perception of XRP being negative? Absolutely not. I'm, I'm already removing that from the list. There's no negative press about XRP and Ripple. Ripple are only doing good things. They're only ac acquiring other businesses. They're only growing. There's only an IPO going public on the horizon for Ripple. Like everything is positive about Ripple. We've got an amazing CEO in Brad Garlinghouse. The CTO in David Schwartz is literally the smartest guy on earth right now. I see no reason why public perception would play a role in the removal from this green list. But there are other things, right? There's one more thing on this list of a logical reason, and that would be internal policies. So the DFS have an extreme amount of power in this green list, so much so that everything they say goes. There's no like outside intervention from like a level playing field. You might get outside intervention as feedback from the SEC, for example, or other regulatory bodies, but essentially, if DFS don't want a token on that green list, it's not going on the green list. On the flip side, if they do want a token on that green list, it's going on the green list. It really is that cut and dry. The definitions on the website were very vague and it, it just was not easy to kind of define what warrants an asset going on the green list or not. That safe and soundness thing was just completely a gray area. I don't, don't understand that. Now, one thing I want to clear up here is that the removal of XRP from DFS's green list does not mean they don't think it's a digital currency, but rather it means they have found something about XRP or Ripple that goes against their safety and soundness policy. That's literally all it comes down to. It doesn't mean they don't think XRP is a currency. I've seen the argument out there and I'm actually, you know, really interested in this topic. If XRP isn't a security and if it's not a currency, what is it? 
you know, lots of people reading in between the lines here saying, well, there's a new definition for XRP coming out, just like the UK has an asset class called digital settlement assets. I think that suits XRP really, really well. And even you could categorize XRP in with different names based on its function, right? So th there's so many ways that you can define XRP. Lots of people were reading into this saying that there is another definition coming from New York about XRP. And while that could very well be a possibility, I, I actually think the removal of it isn't because it's not a currency, is more about because they went against the policies that would categorize XRP to go on the green list. So with all of that said, let's get into the real reasons why XRP has been removed. I think one of the big things here are the competing interests. I think the SEC has it out for XRP. I think they're deliberately hindering XRP in this way. Whether this is DFS or whether this is an outside entity, minimizing the impact of XRP, we it's, it's hard to know. I have a, a little inclination as we get towards the end of the video that might surprise you about uh, DFS's stance on things. But, you know, adding to all of that, I think they're trying to hinder or curb the adoption of XRP. That could be another reason why they would remove it from the list. Maybe perhaps even trying to slow down adoption or perhaps even listen to this one. Maybe all of the institutions already have their XRP. Now it's been removed from anyone else getting in, right? Especially in New York, the financial hub. Potentially, they don't want anyone else to have the XRP from an institutional financial standard level. Maybe they're all ready. You know, that's the, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm getting a bit conspiratorial, I'm not saying this is the fact, but we're drawing conclusions here. It's kind of interesting. I also think that DFS potentially could have some insider info. This is very possible. There are pictures of the head of DFS and Gary Gensler together in the same location. Of course, these people cross paths in the same area, in the same field, if you will. So potentially even on the negative side, and don't mean to get everyone scared here, potentially DFS knows something about Ripple that no one else knows. And maybe that does deem them uh, against their safety and soundness policy. You know, these things can happen. We aren't insiders in this space, right? We are observers from the outside drawing connections. Who knows, potentially DFS knows something about Ripple that we don't. Uh, another one would be essentially just like Gary Gensler, posturing power, showing the world or showing New York their power and influence. And this is a way to say, you think XRP is in the all clear? Nope. We have the power to actually stop XRP. And I don't think they do, but it could be one of those power plays to assert dominance, especially when the SEC has been losing over and over again. People don't really typically think about DFS. Maybe this was an opportunity to make some headlines and have some a show of force and a show of power. I don't typically think that is it, but you've got inside information, you've got trying to curb adoption. All of this stuff is manipulation in, in some capacity. So do I think that the DFS is actually doing something to hinder XRP? I don't think DFS are taking that stance, personally. I think this is outside interference. I really, really do. I think the SEC are salty right now. I think they, are, they cross paths a lot. And I think that it also marries up with one of the reasons why you can remove an asset from the green list, right? If you have feedback from other regulatory bodies that worry the DFS, that is one way to get XRP off a green list or any asset off the green list. And I think that is exactly what's happened. The thing that makes that difficult for me to believe is that Adrian Harris, who's the, the top dog at DFS, and Gary Gensler were going against each other in a court hearing in front of Congress recently. I think it was back in April when all these banks were liquidating and going down. I wanted to watch this clip. Look how Gary Gensler is stance towards crypto and then see Adrian's response to that. And then we'll get into my thoughts. Well, I, if I could just note something about you, you mentioned your hearing about the recent events in the markets. And I would note there were three banks that failed uh, in those handful of days, those last those four or five days. And two of those banks, the first and the third that failed, Silvergate and uh, Signature, were engaged in the crypto business. I mean, some would say they were, you know, crypto banks. So it's interesting just how this was all Thank had some crypto Thank you. narrative as well. It is a misnomer that the failure of Signature Bank was related to crypto. 
What we saw with Signature Bank is that it had a new fashioned bank run and the outflow of deposits uh, were from a broad depositor base, including wholesale food vendors, uh, fiduciaries, trust accounts, law firms. And in fact, the outflow of crypto deposits were in exact proportion to their representation in the depositor base overall. Uh, and in fact, some of those deposit outflows were actually pre-planned. So it's, of course, unfortunate that there was a run on the bank in, at Signature prompted by what we saw with, with SVB. Um, but it is not the case that the failure of Signature was related to crypto. So it seems to me that Adrian Harris doesn't actually really have a negative thing to say about crypto at that point. She was in the defense position on that, right? She was defending crypto. You know, Signature Bank didn't collapse because of crypto, right? Even though Gary Gensler saying, no, basically crypto banks at this point. And she was like, mm, that's not actually true. You know, they actually held large deposits and that were high risk elsewhere. And that's what crushed them. It was the liquidity that crushed those banks. And so she kind of stood up for crypto in that capacity. Now, I'd love to do a deep dive on Adrian Harris to see her connections. I couldn't find any in a little breeze over between her and Ripple or any previous engagement she's had with Ripple to see if there's any tendency or leniency towards Ripple in her stance or in general, her stance on crypto as well. But something else must be happening here because I think if Gary Gensler came in to from the SEC to DFS to say we want to hinder XRP, I feel like Adrian Harris would be like, yeah, but you know, it's not actually causing any issues. It's not security. You just lost. Like there's a difference between feeling salty and whether something is real. I think Adrian would see that. The only way around it though is kind of mischievous and I wouldn't put it past Gary, is to use his influence in all other areas of finance to essentially have almost like a, a crowd opinion, molding, manipulation. He knows so many financial institutions. What if he suggested to those financial institutions that he wanted them to file complaints about Ripple to DFS? Adrian Harris wouldn't be able to do anything about that. They would come through organically as independent feedbacks on Ripple. That potentially could warrant her to say, you know, this goes against our safety and soundness for these digital assets or these virtual currencies. We have to remove it from the list. So all along, it could be Gary Gensler just being salty. I just think that conversation between Adrian and Gary, I don't see that going in Gary's favor just by that little interaction they had at Congress. I would love to know what you think about this whole topic because it's absolutely fascinating, I feel like. And I love going this deep into, into these things and giving the logical reasons and the real reasons why these things are happening. But please do let me know your opinions on what you think in the comments below. As I said earlier, if you found value in this video, please consider hitting subscribe. It really helps the algorithm push out this video and this channel to more people to get the same value that you did. Our whole operation here is expanding and it's very exciting. I'd love to have you along for the ride. We're gonna do some big things in this space, believe me. As always, stay emotionless and I'll see you in the next one.